this is week three. So week three covers uh, kind of a hodgepodge of topics that I think are very important, and we, we somewhat um, diverge from Siegel at this point. So really, statistics is about three things. So it's about gathering data, then analyzing data in an appropriate way, and then presenting the findings. And most stats books do a really good job on the second, um, second in that list, so uh, you know, analyzing data. Um, they do a decent job on the first, which is gathering data through you know, survey samples or, or experimental designs. We'll be talking about that later on in the course. Most of them neglect the presentation of findings. So I put together a, a special presentation on this. There's a whole lot of, um, of you know, out there on, on how to present findings. Two of my fa favorite authors who are absolute um, you know, stars in this area are Edward Tufte. So if you ever have a chance to go see Edward Tufte, he, he travels around the country every summer giving uh, seminars, um, one-day seminars. Uh, it's definitely worth uh, attending. So you definitely want to hear Edward Tufte. Go to his website. Uh, get all of his books. They're all fantastic. Um, I've declared them optional here. I'm just going to give you a little taste of Tufty. The other person that I think um, really has pioneered a lot of you know, graphical um, uh, you know, tools is, is Bill Cleveland. Uh, he wrote two books and actually wrote some other books before these two books on graphing data. Um, that had a huge influence on all the software packages. So every, all the um, modules that you see in SPSS and uh, Minitab, R, S, SAS, were kind of all inspired by Cleveland's work. So both of his books, The Elements of Graphing Data and Visualizing Data, are, uh, are real classics and they're worth reading. So we're going to talk about how to present the results from a study and uh, what we're going to conclude is that the best graphs are going to be those that show a relationship. So kind of one of the headlines from this week is study relationships. So show how what your client cares about, like sales or response or whatever it is, how does that depend on what you do as a marketer, which really kind of brings us back to the IMC process where we're trying to understand um, you know, what is the ROI of our, of our actions? So if I do a certain marketing tactic, um, what happens to this dependent variable? Well, that implies studying a relationship. So week three is really about these two things, um, and they're, we're going to see how, how closely intertwined they are. Let's start out with Tufty. Uh, so you know, Tufty's written four books on... Um, visual displays and you're going to get kind of one slide on it from me um, with some of his other reasoning and, and a lot of the other um, uh, slides that are in this lecture. But Tufti takes on a really uh, important question which is you know what what makes a good graph? And he um, he writes about this in his first book The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. So here's a quote from Tufty, and I thought I'd maybe go over this with you. He gives a, a list of elements of, of a great graph. So graphical excellence is the well-designed presentation of interesting data. So it's really a matter of three things, substance, statistics, and design. So let's talk about these, these three elements. What does he mean by substance, statistics, and design? Well, by substance, he really means uh, it has to address a substantive question about some, you know, field of study. So it, it, the way I read this is, is it, it requires knowledge and expertise about the subject that you're making a graph on. Okay, so if this is a graph about a business problem, you better know something about business. If it's a, you know, something about marketing, you better know something about marketing. Uh, Tufty would also um, 
extend this to, you know, if you're making a graph for a newspaper article about the federal budget, you better know something about federal budgets. All right, so, so you need to know something about the domain the graph applies to. So you need domain knowledge is the way uh, a lot of analytics people would talk about this. You can't just be a statistician. you got to know something about the subject matter. Second component of an excellent graph is that it requires knowledge of statistics. So by this, I mean you need to know about statistical uh, you know, models and the appropriate conclusions that can be drawn from them. So you really need to have had um, a little bit of statistics. Now Tufty, you know, critiques a lot of the people who uh, make graphics for newspapers and magazines and so forth, and very often they're graphic designers who, who don't have any um, uh, statistical training whatsoever. And so if, if, you, if, you, if you don't know the appropriate uses of data and what conclusions can be drawn from data, it's hard to make a good graph. The third component is a design component. So yes, the thing had better look good. It had better tell the story efficiently. Uh, and and that, that means that you've got to really think about your audience. You've got to think about um, all of the components of the graph. Okay, so it's, so it's really all three things. And very often when you, when you see graphs, you can tell that it's made by someone who, who doesn't understand all three components of it. So either you get a graphic designer who's really good on the design part but doesn't know anything about the subject matter or of statistical methods, or you get a statistician who doesn't know anything about design, probably doesn't know anything about the substance either, or you get people who know about the substance don't the other don't know the other two. Graphical excellence consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity precision, and efficiency. All right, so complex ideas means that you're telling a rich story. You know, that this is not um, three numbers that you throw up in a pie chart. So three numbers is, is not going to tell a complex story. So it's, usually it's a, it's a story that you couldn't tell with words alone, and you need graphical um, you know graphs in order to communicate what the what the story is and it's not just communicating the story in any way you want to uh, communicate it clearly with precision and you want to do it efficiently graphical excellence is that which gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space so uh, another um, test that I, I often use when I evaluate a graph is how many words would it take for me to tell this story? Okay, so if the answer is I could tell it in a sentence or two, it's probably not a very uh, you know, rich graph. Uh, if it would take me paragraphs or pages to communicate the same information, then that's, um, you know, you're getting into a, a pretty, um, pretty intense graph. Okay. So it's going to give the viewer the greatest number of ideas, and in the shortest time, least ink, small space. As we'll see, it's almost always multivariate, and it requires telling the truth about data. So um, I want to give you a few examples now of graphical excellence from Tufty, just to give you a little taste of, of, um, of what Tufty does. The first two examples are going to be very narrative, which is usually not what we do in marketing, but um, I, I think they're worth uh, worth going over. And then the remainder of this week's lectures are going to get into the nitty gritty details of of relational graphics that are often used in marketing. Okay, so I have a, a PowerPoint out on Blackboard that has a couple of these graphs in it. So let's flip over to that PowerPoint for now. And this, um, this graph happens to be the cover of Tufty's first book. So Tufty liked it so much that he decided this ought to be the cover of his book. 
This, uh, this graph depicts the train schedule between Paris and Lyon in the 1880s. And rather than just giving a bunch of stations and when the trains arrive, um, this, uh, the author of this graph, Mr. Marais, uh, decided to you know, show the, you know, all the trains on the route, which I you know, think could be very useful if you're um, running this line or even if using it in any, um, in any way. Okay, so each line on this graph is a train. We have the cities. So this is the, the, the line between Paris. You see all the stops in, in between Paris and Lyon. Then you have a 24-hour clock in the horizontal axis. So the steeper the line, the faster the train. So for, for example, let's look at this train right here that leaves shortly before 7, leaves Paris. And you'll see that um, it makes some stops. This presumably is to refuel or... Um, add, at that point it was a steam train, so you probably had, it, uh, have, had to add, add water. Stops in Dijon again for almost an hour, doesn't get in until after midnight. Okay, so leaves at 7 a.m., gets in at midnight. Um, let's take a look at this other line, which is more of an express train for that time. Left at 11 a.m., gets in by 10 p.m. So you get to see where all of the trains are uh, in this, uh, you know, on this route and uh, where they're going to be sitting, uh, and so forth. Tufti then shows the modern TGV. So the modern TGV is a train that goes about 300 kilometers an hour and will do this whole route in uh, under three hours. So quite a comparison. Second graph that I'll show you is, uh, I better make sure that this is showing up right on the, gra on the uh, video, is a graph that Tufti uh, claims is perhaps the greatest graphic of the 19th century. This, um, this graph tells the story of Napoleon's march on Moscow. And it shows uh, seven dimensions of data. So in um, 1812, Napoleon started out at the Polish border with 422,000 troops. The width of this line shows the number of troops that, that uh, Napoleon had at any point in time. So the, um, the line actually shows where he, uh, where he went. So here he's at the Polish border, and Moscow's over here. And so what you see is that the line gets thinner as we get closer and closer to Moscow. So he arrives in Moscow with about 100,000 troops. So he's already lost you know, over three uh, out of every four troop that he started out with. So he starts out with 422, ends up in Moscow with 100,000. So you see latin, latitude and longitude of where he is, the uh, two directions so of, of, of his um, approach, and then the number of troops that he has. And the black line shows the retreat. And what you'll see is the black line gets continually thinner, and he eventually gets back to the Polish border where he started with only 10,000 troops. So he started out with 422,000, ends this uh, expedition with only 10,000 troops. Now, a very um, clever part of this graph is that we get to see some causation. So why was um, Napoleon defeated so badly? And we see a, a couple uh, causes for this. For example, when he crosses certain rivers, you'll see uh, this river in particular was a disaster. It looks like that he, he lost over half of his troops trying to cross this icy river. Um, another cause of Napoleon's defeat was winter. So uh, the temperature uh, is, is, is depicted at the bottom here. And you'll see it was a very cold winter, and that contributed to Napoleon's defeat. So this is a very um, rich graphic. It tells a very complex story. Now let's think back what I what I said about um, richness. So how long, how, how many words would it take for me to tell this story in prose? And for me to be able to tell this would uh, would probably take at least pages to to depict all the details that are shown on this graph 
probably wouldn't be as interesting. You know, this graph is, is, is non-linear in the sense that I don't have to uh, proceed through it in a linear fashion. I can look around and, you know, spot where he crossed rivers and how certain troops flanked off and so forth. I don't have to process it sequentially the way I would in a chapter. So my point is that this is, um, this is telling a very rich and complex story in a concise way. So it really matches up with Tufte's definition of graphical excellence. All right, this next graph um, is pretty garish, I find. The, the colors are uh, lurid here, not, 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 very, um, not very attractive. However, I think the substance of the graph is, um, is quite good. So what this graph shows is media consumption over the past 100 years or so and projects it out another 10 years or so. And it, uh, it very clearly shows a number of things. So first off, media consumption has uh, grown very quickly over the past 100 years. So 100 years ago, or 113 years ago or so, people are only spending about 10 hours a week with media. You're going to notice that the vast majority of that time was spent with print. So that would have been newspapers and perhaps some magazines. Wasn't much else back then. Um, but what's happened is, uh, as time moves on is that we get more and more media channels, and these media channels don't necessarily cannibalize each other. What it cannibalizes is uh, our time doing other things. So uh, we keep adding to our media consumption. As soon as television, analog television, was, was introduced in the 40s, you'll see that people start spending more time with media. You know, at the point where in, in 2020 we're going to be spending 90-some hours a week with media on the average. Uh, so, you know, I think this tells a very rich story. There, there isn't, um, you know, there is some cannibalization, but it's not all cannibalization. Print isn't going away because of all these new digital channels. Um, I guess analog TV is going away because of digital TV, but you'll see TV isn't going away either. Um, so, you know, again, there's a very rich story uh, be, be difficult and boring to tell this with the, with prose. I think the graph does a great job. The uh, last graph that I'm going to show you from Tufty um, is from the Space Shuttle Challenger. So I'm just going to pause it here because I think uh, I had some problems last time I tried to record this. We're going to bring it up in a second. So the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up back in 1986. And uh, you may remember that the immediate cause of, of um, the disaster was O-rings. So there were some O-rings in the rocket engines that failed to seal, uh, and that caused the engines to blow up. But um, Tufti would argue that the real cause of the uh, disaster was bad graphs. So the reason he would say this is that the day before the launch, uh, the engineers at Morton Thiokol, which is a company that made the rockets, the engineers saw the weather forecast and realized that day they knew that this was going to blow up. So they understood the thermal properties of these O-rings, and they, they, you know, based on their understanding of these thermal properties, they, they knew that they would not seal correctly, and that bad things were going to happen, and it was probably going to blow up. So what did they do? They set a, um, a, a, a conference call with NASA and tried to get NASA to call off the launch. Okay, so this is a, you know, in one sense, it's a very typical situation. These engineers had some data, just as you're going to have data in your career, uh, based on your understanding of the situation and your analysis of the data, you're going to have a story, um, and you're going to need to tell that story and convince somebody to do things uh, to follow your recommendation. Well, these engineers were um, not very successful, and you know, the, as a consequence, uh, training of engineers has been re-examined, and they've introduced statistics courses and and. And, and so and so forth. Well, let me show you um, what data the engineers had 
available at their fingertips the day before the launch. So this is a graph that uh, is actually in both Tufty's books and in Cleveland's books. Uh, I think Cleveland was the first one to publish it. That, um, that point out a, a graph that could have been sent and I think would have been much more effective than what, um, what they did. So uh, let's start with the graph, then we'll talk about what they sent out. This uh, space shuttle, the space shuttles have been launched quite a few times in the past, and each one of these dots indicates a previous launch of the space shuttle. Now, what happens when you launch this is that, uh, you know, the, the rocket uh, engines propel this thing up towards space, and at some point the rocket engines drop off into the ocean where they're retrieved. So they retrieve them, and then they analyze them. So they look at how much damage there was to the O-ring in particular, and so what we have here is um, the temperature on the day of the launch, that's our key causal variable, plotted on the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is going to show the damage due to the O-rings. So what you're going to see in this graph is that whenever you launch it above about 65 degrees or so, uh, there's usually no problem. So all these points down here indicate no problem. There's a couple instances where there was a little bit of damage, but for the most part, no problem. Now, once you drop below about 65 degrees, uh, following this theory that, you know, the O-rings don't seal correctly, what you'll see is that we, we, we observe damage, and we see a negative relationship. So the colder it is, the more damage that occurs to the O-ring. So here was a launch at about 63 degrees. You had some, had a couple launches in the upper 50s. You had more damage. There was once when it was launched at about 53 degrees and there was quite a bit of damage. So this is plainly showing the data. Um, we're plotting the outcome that we care about, which is O-ring damage against the causal factor, so temperature in this case. And the story is not good. So you can connect the dots, and what you see is a, a, a curve that's not going anywhere uh, where you want it to go. Okay, so this region off to the left is the forecast uh, temperature on the day of the launch. So it's going to be below freezing. So if you extrapolate this curve, uh, this could be a you know a, a big problem, and you know hopefully. If you were a decision maker at NASA and you saw a graph like this, you would call off the launch. Well, what did they send? Well, they sent a fax, and this uh, this is a kind of a, a you know, pre-PowerPoint slide, if you will, that they faxed to them, handwritten, with the core bit of evidence on it. Now, let me take you through um, a, a lot of things that they did wrong. So, first off, um, they only showed previous launches where there was damage. So you'll see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those seven launches shown, those correspond to these seven points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so it's as if these other points didn't exist. So you see how I've made those vanish? Now, if you look at you know, look at this graph, the, uh, the the trend isn't nearly so consistent. So it looks like there was a little bit of damage and then there was one with a little bit more damage. So it's having these points, oops, having these points is absolutely essential to understanding the story. So it's like they threw out two-thirds of their data uh, because they thought it wasn't important when in fact it was critically important. So that that's a, a huge mistake. There are a number of other mistakes though that they made. Um, first off, keep keep in mind your audience. So what are all these acronyms? MBT, AMB, O-ring, I don't know what any of this stuff means. Alright, so if you're a decision maker at NASA, uh, these acronyms aren't going to mean much to you. Look what Tufty did. So Tufty used plain English, O-ring damage. Anybody, any manager can understand that. 
temperature of the uh, uh, field joints at the time of launch. Any manager can understand that. So you know, make your graphs in the the audience in the language of the audience. A couple other uh, issues. First off, and then one other issue is wind speed. So what does wind speed have to do with anything? And the answer is nothing. So. Uh, Moreover, it seems to be pretty constant across most of these launches. So if you put superfluous information on your graphs, chances are you're going to get asked, um, well, let's talk about wind speed. So then all of a sudden you're off topic, you're off into the weeds for a 15-minute discussion about wind speed, and that has nothing to do with your theory. So you've got to focus your graphs on your story. So the story here is temperature affects O-ring damage and that's what's shown by this graph. All right, so that's a nice introduction to Tufty and um, you know I, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how good his stuff is so if you ever get the chance to hear him uh, do so. Uh, I encourage you to go check his books out of the library. They're in every, every library in the country. Uh, and I'll also put in a plug for Cleveland, whose work is um, is is uh, equally good, although very different than uh, than Tufties.